told that in the end we're going to make a decision called the atonement, which is a decision, but it's more of an acceptance than a decision. It's like it's not something new that we invent. The Holy Spirit's got it there, like holding for us and saying, here it is, come and get it. <laughs> and, and what's in the way is just some beliefs, some egoic beliefs that stand in the way. So we have to, we kind of march toward that decision, toward the atonement with the Holy Spirit, because it would be like going up a mountain and not knowing the <coughs> pathways up the mountain. You know, you know, the Holy Spirit knows the pathways up the mountain, and the atonement's like at the top of the mountain. And we're coming out, we're crisscrossing, hey, you again, hey, Bill and I were high five. <laughs> I, you meet people along the way, oh, nice to see you again. Well, got to go on, Spirit's calling me over here, I got to... Go and we crisscross and we crisscross and we keep coming up towards that atonement. And the atonement we might say is is when you yield into that that decision, you know, he says, when you have learned how to, to decide with God, every decision becomes as easy and as right as breathing. And it's as if you'll be carried down a quiet path in summer. Well, <laughs> that's, that's worth going for. Why wouldn't we go up the mountain if it's that easy? It's easy and as right as breathing. So here's the beliefs. And then he says an interesting line in the Course, he says, a decision is a conclusion based on everything that you believe. So imagine, let's use a computer analogy. You've got a hard drive, and you load your hard drive with beliefs. Lots of beliefs. Egoic beliefs. Time-space beliefs. And you've got the whole hard drive loaded with those, and then you've got your little RAM operating memory that's helping the, the software, the current software program run. And of course, the, comp the operating system is pulling from the hard drive uh, to run the programs. You could say you got relationships. Those are the egoic beliefs that are underneath every decision you seem to make. So you, des you decide to come to this retreat. Well. That's just a decision, that's a conclusion based on everything that you believe, everything that's down in the hard drive. How could you come to Fruitland, Utah, to a monastery, unless you believed in uh, time and space, in a, in a state called Utah, in a country called the United States of America, and if you being a man or a woman, uh, or whatever else <laughs> you believe you are, uh, and then coming and, and driving, and so all these beliefs, you know, in time and space, and then there's a little story, a little scenario going on that seems to be the motion picture that's playing out of all your beliefs. And eventually, I mean, a lot of times people do say, okay, if that's the, the metaphor, I want to do a wipe disk. Uh, uh, you know, the, some of you know computer terminology, there you can do a wipe disk, <laughs> MS-DOS, wipe disk, and wipe out the hard drive. And the good news is Jesus is saying, yeah, that's actually possible. There is a wipe this command, and in any instant, uh, you can you can do that. Uh, that's really a, a very optimistic thing <laughs> to know that it's actually there, but it's usually not experienced that way. You know, usually there's a process that's involved in the wipe disk. Usually there's a process of deleting that's going on. It's very rare. I mean, even in contemporary modern-day mystics like, um, like Eckhart Tolle, you know, they'll talk about park bench experiences or kind of rapid white disc experiences, like illumination experiences. And those are good. It's good to hear about those. It makes you think, well, that could happen to me. <laughs> could have a white disc. But for most, it's, it's clearing away those beliefs. And, and it's usually done in a gradual way. You know, and it's usually done where you, you just kind of, aha, you notice something. I'm still playing out this role or that role, like Suzanne was just saying, you know, the good daughter role. You know, okay, I've got to be a good, dutiful daughter, and then, ooh, there's a lot of emotion that comes with that. As if you failed at something, and as, as if you've done something wrong. And remember, the ego, ego set up all the roles uh, to manufacture and to to keep its guilt going. Uh, you can't be the Christ and the role. So Jesus says, well, let's, let's try this. I'll give you a role that is a shared role. All of your role are private roles. They're, they're really not shared. They're all private roles. I'll give you a shared role, and we'll call it forgiveness. 
He'll call it the happy dream. We'll call it the real world. We'll call it the borderland. We'll call it a number of different things. But it's shared. And you share it with the Holy Spirit. You know, it's completely shared. And so when you reach that point, you share it with the Holy Spirit and you share it with all your brothers and sisters. In fact, it's the only thing in this world that you can share. You can't share bodies. You can't share a bank account. You can't share property. You can't share anything. You can't even share uh, opinions, you know, oh, so and so and I, we share the same opinions about this and that. You can't really do it. But you can share a perspective of looking upon the world with the Holy Spirit. And that high perspective has been called many different names in quantum physics. It's the quantum field, where everything is totally energy and it's all connected. It just has different names in different traditions. So really, this is a journey where you are uncovering these unconscious beliefs. You're just raising them up and you're bringing them up to the light and awareness and then they disappear. Uh, so you don't have to battle them, you don't have to fight them, you don't have to attack them or anything. You just raise them up into awareness and eventually this construct of unconscious and conscious disappears. You know, you might call it fully conscious. You become fully conscious. What a good way to end the unconscious. <laughs> uh, in fact, Jesus one time defined the unconscious as the unwatched mind. There's parts that in, are in your basement, that are, or we'll say down on the hard drive, that you're not even watching. You didn't want to know that they were there. Oh, I didn't want to know about that. <laughs> ooh, that's a dark, dirt, dark, dirty, ooh, no, no, don't, don't care to know about that. Happy, happy, happy. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, but what you do is you allow those beliefs to come up and you are shown how to look with the Holy Spirit at those beliefs and see their nothingness. And that's what raises them up into the light. And then, of course, the end is that you become fully conscious, you know, or as they say, like, like in Buddhism, mindfulness. You have, you have mindfulness. You're whole. You're complete. You're not fooled by any more of those roles or beliefs, you know, that you see that those aren't who you are. And they never have been. You never were those things. They were memory implants, like we heard on the clip. <laughs> memory implants. So that whole process you're talking about is really the forgiveness process. Yeah, that's the forgiveness process. And we could say that the atonement is the, is the completion. In fact, the atonement, we'll say it's at the top of the mountain because Jesus describes the atonement as the first miracle and the last miracle and all the miracles in between. It's got a sense of finality to it. So I am whole. Yes, in the end, the Holy Spirit ceases to be a messenger or a bridge. It's who I am. It's it literally, it's the memory uh, that, that was pushed out of awareness, the memory of, of God in the mind. No longer an agent, no, no longer a, an, an entity. And, and in wholeness, we could say that's where the Trinity collapses, is, is, you know, they always talk about three and one. Well, there's not really three. You know, those were just little metaphors along the way. And there was a, an aspect of the Holy Spirit that seemed to see, it, see a world, or, or seemed to, to understand that there was an error that needed to be corrected, and take the form of a voice, but that disappears too. That's another one of the hallucinations, that the Holy Spirit is a voice. Well, a voice as long as you seem to need one, but if you're it, what do you need a voice for? <laughs> If you're pure beingness, you don't even need a voice. So you see how it's all just metaphors and constructs to gently guide the mind to a place where, you know, you can let it go. 